Our first presentation is from Mr James Woodhelson. I'm pleased to introduce him. He has a track record in forecasting trends and innovation. James is well placed to tell us about how companies in manufacturing and energy like ours can be better prepared to respond to the future opportunities in the global marketplace. James, if you please. Thanks, Andy. Well, good morning, everybody. Lovely to see you here. Uh, we could talk about looking at the worldwide situation and energy, the fall of Mosul. I trust you're tracking that. We could talk about him, but we won't. Uh, and we could talk about the underestimated disputes between China and Japan and what they mean for the world economy and energy. You can see how well uh, Abe and Xi Jinping are getting on here. <coughs> Uh, well, you didn't get that one. I know it's a bit early. But uh, I thought what we might begin with was, was the remarks that I heard just yesterday from Mike Hawes, the chief of the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders, attacking what he called the demonization of diesel. And uh, If you go to the BBC website, you'll see that just yesterday. And I think that's one of the issues you need to face. I want to begin by suggesting a couple of ways of beginning to uh, do that. And that is your visualization of the data about particulates and about CO2 and about how your machines work has got to take a step up. Nearly everybody's data visualization has to do that. If you look at uh, the head of Salesforce.com, he uh, rubbishes rather unfairly social media, the cloud, and mobile, but rightly says that the acquisition and interpretation and display uh, and the viewing of data is really a key issue insofar as your industry is involved in IT, which more and more it is. And when we look at the broader tableau for uh, data visualization, there's a lot that's going to change in the next 10 years. This is the largest oil refinery in the world in Jamnagar, uh, Gujarat, India. We'll probably all be working like that with any luck in the next few years. Um, so when we're thinking about matters visual, Engineers have a love life too, they have aesthetics, they have sensibilities. It's time to take the display of what you do uh, very seriously, particularly in relation to emissions and scientific matters. This is Tiananmen Square in China where they take visualization pretty importantly. And it's going to go a lot further. When a building can become a display, uh, you should be on the 47th floor of wherever you are with your uh, generator sets um, saying there's one here and making a movie about it. So that's one of the things just to kick off with. On a very practical note, I don't see even from Mike Hawes the data about particulates and CO2, and that's something that we need more of, data visualization. I'm not going to go into how you do it, uh, the principles of it, although they're rather important, uh, if you can pick up the PDF or watch the video later and get a few clues as to how to go forward. But in all matters to do with uh, emissions, getting that data and it displaying it and showing how you're improving and how your innovation is lowering things rather than making them worse, that will be important. In one of your little slides just before, you talked about design. And looking at Cummins Engine, I thought of this man, Paul Rand. He's the guy who designed the corporate identity for Cummins Engine. Uh, I interviewed him just before he died. So much easier before they die. Uh, and great. Uh, and he did a lot of very important things uh, from the 60s and so on. Uh, wonderful, wonderful corporate identities and jokes about Big Blue and so on, which was really out of step. And if you look at these greats in design, all of these I interviewed, Dieter Rams, the man who did the uh, brown shavers and uh, fan heaters in the 60s, Raymond Lowy, who did the Greyhound bus and the Gestetner duplicator, they were very clear about what design represented. And I'm sure you have a lot of this stuff in common. Anyway, we used to be clear in design. I spent much of my life in it. Uh, about these sorts of things. But in the 90s, and especially in the noughties, this book came to the fore about how really the focus of design must be to change people's behavior. And I don't agree with that. Uh, and it's interesting, if you take the car industry again, which is so uh, blamed for emissions, um, all the people who are irrationally 
treating the question of climate change, one to say that, you know, you, especially all the men in the audience, which is 99% of you, are bad people uh, and you must change your habits, if not your DNA. And you look at what they say about cars, um, all these sort of environmental headbangers, uh, and by the time the third one has associated cars uh, with sex, then you begin to wonder whether they have more on their mind than just cars uh, and emissions. And uh, I think what that shows us is that, and I know what I'm talking about here, the focus in design and in art schools and in universities is now very different from what the greats pioneered in the past. It's about minimizing your impact on the world, not convenience and modernity. And I think that's a great pity because where I come from, engineering and design are supposed to increase your impact on the world. Now, how do we focus data visualization and design in a way that's relevant to you? Well, if you look at what's happening in retailing, there are some very fast changes there to do with the interaction that people have with mobiles. Even in the shop A that you're shopping in, you might be buying from shop B somewhere else. And when we look at the penetration of that way of doing things and the speed with which you can do things with the visualization of information on the mobile, there's much for your industry to learn about how your staff deal with things, about how you organize your data, so that people in these remote locations where you work, in these difficult circumstances, can call you, discuss with you things. And that's before we've got the Apple Watch which may allow people to buy components from it, and the upmarket Apple Watch, which we'll never be able to afford. So I want to say, what does it all mean for you? Improve your data skills in the sense of grabbing it, interpreting it, and displaying it. Don't believe that innovation must always be green. That's a big mistake that the European Commission is making at the moment. And do learn from what's happening in retail. You're in a B2B market. I understand all of that. But the expectations of the purchase procedure are set often by women in fashion retailing. And we better get hip to that if you want to sell more kit. Now, when we're thinking about the future turning to another issue, I know that you have often thought about uh, power cuts, and I urge you on your website to get the very best data on power cuts, even better than Wikipedia, which doesn't do a bad job on this issue, to show the length, uh, intensity, and frequency, and geographical distribution so that you can talk up your offer. Data visualization will be important in that. And the other thing you might check out in that whole thing, just practically, is uh, the wonderfully named Brad Frost from New York City about making your website begin with the mobile experience, not have it as an afterthought. OK, so uh, just on the nitty gritty, now let me talk to the bigger issue. You're tracking power cuts. You need to display them better and more persuasively. But we also know, don't we, that there can be power cuts or price spikes, even in an era when oil prices, most salient feature of the current moment, have dropped by 50% since last year. So what we find is prices are more fluid. At the moment, this man, through the mobile experience, is bringing about a lot of deflation to many, many markets. Thankfully, you can't yet buy a genset over Amazon, but the day may come. So what I'm saying here is that you've got to innovate round not just deflation or inflation, but a broader issue of price volatility. 50% drop in oil, how did that happen? Well, it's not the end of the world. Oil will probably rebound, and natural gas vehicles, for those of you running fleets, are going to be important in all of this. But there is a problem in terms of European demand, which has undoubtedly fueled speculation that there will not be much uh, call for oil in the future. But when you look at the decline that's caused the most problem in a, a, economics, that of China, 7.9% to about 7.4%, could a half percent drop in GDP growth really prompt a 50% drop in oil? And I think if you look at the long-term fundamentals, Asia looks good for your industry, good for oil and gas, good for energy demand generally, uh, and the motorization of Asia will be accompanied also 
by more and more electricity use. And if you look at uh, Narendra Modi's plans in India to build railways, high-speed ones, in the next few years, he may not be successful, but I think there's every reason to suspect that the oil price will rebound in these kinds of uh, conditions. What I think much more explains the drop in oil prices is not the uh, weak demand conditions, even though they exist in Europe, but a broader problem of financialization. If everything turns into finance, that can exaggerate the swings and make for the kind of confusion that's now happened. And I think when we're talking financialization, we're not just talking the banks, we're talking this man, anybody know who he is? He's Carly Khan, who's trying to get Apple and not to invest more of its 150 billion cash hoard in laboratories, but to give more back to shareholders. That's what I mean by financialization, where even Apple can be more interested in these questions in many ways than in new technology. And I, I think we saw a key moment in this, which I just checked up, you might have a look at it, when Goldman Sachs controlled a quarter of the world's aluminium market recently. We can see the kind of febrile atmosphere that uh, accompanies commodities today. When shale gas producers and energy companies in the States have been the main force for growing indebtedness there in the corporate world, that's also a worry. When you look at all the M&A, the mergers and acquisitions, the buybacks, the dividend payouts and so on, what a contrast that makes with the weak world of energy R&D. By getting into all that finance, then you get these commodity swings and you're neglecting the main event, which is that in energy, the International Energy Agency director looks happy enough here. She's a fellow Dutch person, but she's not that happy and she's right not to be happy because energy R&D is pretty poor. I accept the current audience from this. If you look at the big spenders on R&D, there are some very famous names up there and you can see that their research intensity in which they're involved, the percentage of sales that they're spending on R&D is pretty high, especially for pharmaceuticals, as you might imagine. Go down to oil and gas, and with the exception of Schlumberger, the um, oil services provider, you're looking at very little of the incoming money being spent in laboratories. Same with electricity, very weak. Same also with utilities. So that's an example of what not to do. We've got to uh, expect turbulence in prices and so on, and it'll be often low prices for a long time and uh, tightened margins. But what we must realize is that only your sustained technological innovation, not financial innovation, not just eco-innovation where the alpha and the omega is CO2, but productivity raising, convenience raising, and all of the things that you talk about when you use this rather dubious phrase, mission critical. I don't know anybody who doesn't have a mission critical job uh, in my life. But uh, nevertheless, the, your, the, how people need your stuff in extremis, that should be the main argument that you are taking to people and that should be the main focus of your innovation, the reliability, the small footprint physically, the interaction that goes on with your machines, all of these things, they're your only guarantee. And it's not just me saying this, but gradually the oil and gas industry is waking up to the need for some serious R&D. And uh, Dr. Abdullah Wala al Sadun, I can hardly get my mouth around that, is one of the interesting people in suggesting that there's a long way for the Middle East to go. They're late to the party in R&D, but they're going to be taking it a lot more seriously. It's interesting that he says that. You don't often hear it from Western oil and gas producers, that we're, we're going to get really into that. And I think the overall climate is not auspicious in the West for innovation. It's better in China, India, and now the Middle East. Because when you've got a December 2014 article in the Harvard Business Review saying this is the way you've got to go, it's wonderful, isn't it? Will not require years of work or fundamental changes in the way the organization runs or a significant allocation of resources. Well, great. Innovation. You, know, you can forget about the Manhattan Project, dubious the results were, but you can just do it in tiny little bits. Make it minimum. Actually, in the same issue of the Harvard Business Review, how many of you read the Harvard Business Review? 
Well, there's your chairman or ex-chairman. There's always some sad people around. But uh, nevertheless, if you read that same issue, there's a much better article um, looking at Peter Drucker's management by objectives and then applying the same ideas to experiments and prototypes, sticking with them, abiding by them, making sure they're doable in the first place, that they're reliable experiments, you get the most out of them with your prototyping and so on. That's a good article, check it out. And the whole philosophy of prototypes, making mistakes, setbacks, is something that you might be looking at a little more closely. What does it mean for you? Well, you're research and development people, and the engineers generally need a friendlier response than you are getting, uh, that they are getting and you are giving at the moment. Be more ambitious. Look to the achievements and the heroism of past engineers and of future professionals. Get more professional in your experiments and prototypes and find the money. It's time. The money's tight. But the only guarantee the f against the money remaining tight is you moving ahead with new technology. Why do I say all of that? Because everybody goes, oh, innovation, man. If you look at the real barriers to it, they're growing. There's the engineers who say you can't do that. There's always a few of them. We tried, can't be done. Oh, yes. There's the financial people, the bean counters, who say you can't do that. There's the lawyers and the regulators. There's the, if you're a small and medium firm, there's your cash crisis. If you're a big one, the shareholders are demanding. Short-term vision, siloization. But the biggest one is the adversity, uh, adverse attitude to risk that we have here and in much of the West. So I thought I'd just illustrate that sort of apprehension about the f uh, future and the unwillingness to experiment by just mentioning all the things that we'd like to stop in Britain. And if you have a look at them, you'd probably like to stop a few yourself. But um, and when you add it all up, what we're not allowed to do, what isn't politically correct, what's too dangerous and so on, is a big cultural pressure against innovation. So, when we look around, really stressing it, showing that it's difficult, showing that it's hard, showing that you've got to find the budget for it, and r really taking a forthright attitude to it, a comprehensive attitude to it, is the most important thing. Some poor sap has to read the um, BP Statistical World Review of uh, Energy, and I'm afraid it's me, but if you look at the numbers there, and you run the numbers, one very interesting thing happens. The rate of discovery of proven reserves is falling, probably because of the recession. But if you go back 20, 25 years, you know, the increase in oil and gas has really been enormous. There's every reason to suppose that we can still find more. By contrast, what we're told as consumers is that we're all to blame. This is where the nudging comes in. You know, you personally, in your habits, are to blame for climate change. You must clear your slops. The science tells you that you shouldn't be doing that. But if you look at my little laser pointer here at the top, uh, top left, households account for 9% of the waste in Europe. So when we're talking recycling, the big issue is your components, how you design for recycling, for disposability, for reuse, and all of those things. And that makes sense on a grand scale. The finger-wagging perspective does not. And I mention this because the irrationality that now surrounds sort of recycling and carbon has got so great that um, it's easy to be sucked into it. I believe in climate change. The book that you're getting in my, your pack goes into that in a whole chapter. But whether the way to deal with climate change is fixing your slops uh, from your cooking and, you know, those peeled potatoes and all the rest of it, I don't think so. The man who believes that it is is this... Uh, a man who's very influential in Brussels and elsewhere. And he shows how the behavioral perspective, the nudge perspective, is so hostile to all the things that I believe you can bring, productivity, reliability, lack of interruption to power supply, and so on. And what he says is we've got to tax the nasty stuff and move into a regime that's inherently more labor-intensive because it's small-scale. That's the exact opposite of what I'm trying to say. We need to increase the capital intensity of what we're doing and not increase the labor intensity. And your measurement of the time it sets to set up your machinery and uh, how fast it works and all of these things 
is the real achievement, the big achievement that you have to offer. Rather than feel guilty and all, always on the back foot about CO2 and particulates, we should be moving forward and recognizing how carbon is going to be important as one element, along with many other metals and so on, but as an element that's already going into engineering big time, and therefore simply bad-mouthing it and guilt-tripping people isn't the way to go. I hope you're having a look or ha opening a file on carbon nanotubes. They're doing some clever stuff. They look like this, and they're already changing the face of electronics. So carbon, working with semiconductors, is making for bendier displays and so on. Carbon, in the shape of graphene, could make us radiators, and no doubt components for you, that are bendy, thin, less than one millimeter thick. So when we're thinking about resources and recycling, we are not running out in the way that extreme environmentalists like to say. We should be recycling, but the big stuff on an industrial and automated scale. Carbon is a miracle element. And what we need to be heading towards, and you need to keep an eye on, is how your components, your emissions, and the way you fit in with the energy industry is going to move as part of wider moves to world towards not a new carbon economy, that would be overstating it, just like a hydrogen economy is really overstating it, but a new carbon infrastructure where carbon is valued for what it is. Now, what does this mean for you? Well, if you look at the people who have really moved ahead in energy and made the most of what carbon can do for transport, because at the moment, electric cars are not going to cut it, I say at the moment, for the next 10 or 20 years. If you take the shale gas industry, it's an IT-intensive industry. They're using these kinds of sensors and a whole array of X-ray spectroscopy and um, color analysis and uh, NMR and all sorts of things to look at what's underneath there. Sensing is also important for recycling of surface-mounted devices in um, printed circuit boards, and that's already being investigated on an automated basis. No more poor laborers in developing countries having to sort this stuff and breathe the fumes by hand. Same in the paper industry, and in packaging and recycling that, sensing is the name of the game. And this, for your information, is an electronic nose. It can tell you whether the meat is off. It's 80 bucks on Amazon. So you look at that, that gives you one imperative for the future. If you look at this in terms of what we could do with recycling, or how we could grow genetically modified trees to absorb the carbon, or how more forests in Europe could actually increase the carbon capture that we're doing from 10% of emissions to 12%, which is quite important. And you look at what the Americans are doing with all kinds of very simple ingredients and genetically modified <gasps> microbes, they are turning the CO2 that Britain made in the Victorian era into something useful, cheap ethanol. And the same with the deliciously named American company, Skyonic. You know, it's sky and it's supersonic. And you take the emissions from a factory and you turn them into household products. So is it your job, given your very small percentage of the world's energy supply, to save the planet when you're doing maybe 1% or 2%, just like Britain's going to save the planet when we're responsible for 1% or 2% of emissions, when you're dealing with people who are actually trying to solve the problem at root by dealing not with uh, the new emissions, but the old emissions of Britain, and turning them to good effect, is it really your job to always apologize for the CO2 you're making? Shouldn't you be pointing people to the innovation possibilities that are possible with carbon, and the fact that other uh, forces beyond the uh, genset uh, industry are responsible for the anthropogenic component of climate change. After all, we don't know very much about CO2. A hundred years after we did some chemistry about it, these American scientists are there to tell us that, in fact, we've got everything to learn about it. So I'd open a file on CO2, if I were you, along with the kind of materials that I've talked about, the carbon-based materials, that will figure in your products in the future. So what does it mean from you? Recruit IT people 
who know about sensing. Because sensing your customers, sensing the problems that you have, and he's taking a note. I know I've got five minutes to go. Uh, and, um, you know, taking seriously the new world of the Internet of Things. Except let's not call it that. Because it, it, things don't tell you anything, and the Internet doesn't tell you very much. And even sensors don't. There's a human factor involved. We'll come to that. Look out for the potential in carbon and leave the cuts to other people. Irresponsible? No. Realistic. Talk up the benefits of carbon and quantify, display the growing benefits of your innovation around your machines and services. You might take a leaf from Uber's book. Do I buy Uber? Well, not $18 billion worth. But if you look at what they're doing with mobile and delivery and visual things, then the romance of new applications, of new technology, rather than consumption cuts, really comes through. OK, just to conclude, which technologies will be important? I've talked about some. Which are not going to be so important? Well, first of all, I love robots. And you'll be seeing a lot more of them, I hope. They're smaller. They're more sophisticated. They work with people rather than just taking their jobs. And they can even hit you in the solar plexus and, and allow you to live. But they are not coming in anything like the quantities that I would like. If you look at the numbers, and again, some poor sap has to look at the numbers. I got them here. You can see that they dipped after the Lehman Brothers crisis. Now they're heading up for 200,000 global sales a year. It's terrific. They are getting better. But the sclerotic Obama administration is able to create 250,000 burger-flipping jobs every month. So to sell 200,000 robots around the world means they're not going to be taking your jobs, thankfully, anytime soon. I wish we'd see more of them and that you would have to retrain. But you need to be following it, and you need to be following just how much the human factor is important, say, in subsea or in uh, offshore, We've got all of these lovely yellow machines, but they are remote operating vehicles. In arduous environments, again, the human factor is very important. So you'd be looking closely in your technological forecasting to what's happening in subsea technologies, what they're trying to do, where the new markets will be. But I fear this Dan Dare oil industry on the ocean floor with people visiting uh, won't be happening because, you know, when Watson, the IBM computer, won that quiz show that they always go on about, you know, Jeopardy, I think it's called, or something like that, did it know that it had won? That's a question we've got to ask, right? Because uh, it didn't. And therefore, we've got to be skeptical about artificial intelligence, robots taking over, and all of these things. Well, I think, despite their military background, you might be advised to keep an eye on what they could do for your operations, even perhaps offshore, is in drones. America has got a lot of legislation preventing them. Britain is moving ahead with them. They're getting more beautiful. They're also insect-powered. And it's not just drones, but there's a wider issue here, not just for operations, but going back to manufacturing, about what printing can do now for you to change the subject. You can now print nearly anything on nearly anything. And that, for me, is probably going to be more important than the vision of consumerized 3D printing and all of your staff grinding out a component on site somewhere in Aboriginal Australia, which is really isolated. Um, no, 3D printing is not going to work like that. It's going to work in tandem with other techniques pioneered by Jaguar Land Rover, uh, no doubt by ABB and Perkins and all the other wonderful companies assembled here together. The 3D aspect of new product development is just as important to prototyping as 3D printing. And there's another element that's just come on the scene that we're going to see a bit more of in the next few years, where electronics isn't just printed and 2D, but in fact 3D. A trivial application is a dice that glows uh, each time it lands on a six or something like that. They've already made one, but it's load-bearing structural electronics, ladies and gentlemen, that promises to give uh, a whole new range of manufacturing techniques. 
3D printing has its merits as a prototyping device. You probably need to be having a look in NPD at Microsoft's HoloLens, which will make 3D holograms for you and then 3D print off them. Let me just conclude by saying in service matters, let's remember one piece of realism. All the technology that you introduce is all very well, but most of your customers don't especially want a relationship with you. I don't want a relationship with British Gas. They think they're in a relationship with me, but I'm not in a relationship with them. So don't do the frills, don't do the social media and all the Twitter, if, if you can avoid it. Just engage with the basics to deliver the new technologies, the innovation, the benefits, the time-saving service that I've talked about. Who's responsible for that? Not robots, not technology, but your insightful staff. It's your insightful staff who will often be older in the future, who are also in need of a lot more budget and investment. They're the ones who mobilize big data, interpret it, and make a difference. They are the intelligent ones. They're going to be older, time to use them properly, not just for their experience, but for their curiosity. We're going to see a lot more of this around the world. So just to end, um, more robots, bring it on. Less hype about AI. Do research these issues and think how they could work for you. And get the core business right by having the staff right. Their brains, your insight, your aesthetics and sensibility to interaction and all the rest of it is one thing, ladies and gentlemen, they'll never automate. So let's go forward and there's a great new world if you want it.